I'm Any New Province, and this week we're playing Jess Guy Control for Net Benefits, the series where we explore the benefits of net decking in Popper. This week we're taking a short break from looking at decks that have performed well in high attendance tournaments to have a look at this awesome Jess Guy Control list that Making Smart Plays has posted a 5-0 result with in the past two weeks with Magic the Gathering Online League results. Unlike modern Jess Guy Control lists, which are looking to use a ton of counter magic supreme verdicts and win the game by attacking with Celestial Colonnades and Snapcaster Mages, this deck is trying to to use efficient red removal to deal with threats once they hit the battlefield and then win with evasive flyers. I'll go over all of that great removal magic first, starting with Lightning Bolt, which costs 1 red to deal 3 damage to any target at instant speed. Lightning Bolt is an incredibly versatile and efficient piece of removal magic. You can use it in the early game to get rid of your opponent's creatures, and then you can finish your opponent off with it if your evasive flyers can't get through for those last points of damage. There are some decks that have creatures that are too big to remove with a single lightning bolt, that's why Flame Slash is also included. It costs 1 red for a sorcery that deals 4 damage to target creature. Our last deal damage for a single red mana spell often costs 6 to get a little bit of extra effect. This is Fire Bolt. It deals 2 damage to any target and you can flash it back out of your graveyard for 5 mana. Fire Bolt is creeping its way up to the top slot in my favorite red spells. You can mow down a board with a couple of these and you can also just deal your opponent 4 straight damage to their face in a pinch. Speaking of mowing down boards. This is our last piece of red interaction, and it's a good one. It's Swirling Sandstorm, which costs three and a red, and you have to have seven cards in your graveyard for it to do anything at all, but we should be able to get there. If you have seven cards in your graveyard, Swirling Sandstorm deals five damage to each creature without flying. While this isn't a Wrath of God, and it is a little bit worse against Delver-based decks, Swirling Sandstorm does an excellent impression of a board wipe, and we're going to be hoping to use it to that effect very often. This deck is running some non-red interaction as well, because occasionally you need a catch-all removal spell like this one, Journey to Nowhere. It costs 1 and a white for an enchantment, and when it enters the battlefield you exile target creature. If it leaves the battlefield, you return the exiled creature to the battlefield under its owner's control. It always feels good to have some Journey to Nowheres in your deck for things like Gurmog Anglers or Ulamog's Crushers, but it also feels good when you can recur permanence. Sometimes the creature that's hidden under the Journey to Nowhere isn't as high value for your opponent anymore. You can pick up your Journey to Nowhere and re cast it on the thing that actually matters. Our final bit of targeted interaction is Serrated Arrows. It costs 4 generic mana, and when it enters the battlefield, it gets 3 arrowhead counters. At the beginning of your upkeep, if there are no arrowhead counters on Serrated Arrows, sacrifice it. We're going to try to recur this permanent as many times as we can to always have arrow counters at the ready. Its ability is tap, remove an arrowhead counter from Serrated Arrows, put a minus 1, minus 1 counter on target creature. These arrows are fantastic for flavorfully shooting fairies out of the sky, but they're also really good against decks like Tireless Tribe or Affinity. If you shrink down a creature, the temporary buffs that they're giving to it will go away at end of turn, the counters will remain, and the creature will still die. Next, I'll mention some of our card filtering, which synergizes really well with our Fire Bolts and our Swirling Sandstorms. It's Faithless Looting. It costs one red for a sorcery that allows you to draw two cards, then discard two cards. You can also flash it back out of your graveyard for two and a red. While you want to be able to recur Faithless Looting out of your graveyard with its flashback ability to get true value, you, this next card is going to replace itself so long as it resolves and hits the battlefield. This is Seagate Oracle, which is the start of our creature-based value. It costs 2 and a blue for a 1-3, and when it enters the battlefield, you look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the other on the bottom of your library. A control deck that's constantly looking for answers or finally find that evasive threat to start winning the game is so thankful to have a creature that digs them deep and puts a button away for any of your opponent's aggressive ground creatures. Seagate Oracle fills that role perfectly. Next, we have Cortisar, one of my favorite recent downshifts that filters cards excellently and does not ask much of you to leave a body around afterwards. Cortisar costs 2 and a blue for a 1-3 Vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, you look at the top 3 cards of your library, then put one of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. That's pretty great on its own, but you do have to jump through the hoop of paying white mana when you pay the 3 to cast it, or else you have to sacrifice it when it enters the battlefield. We're also running Lone Missionary 
legendaries, which cost one and a white for a 2-1, and when they enter the battlefield, they gain you four life. The first time you trigger this ability, it probably doesn't feel that great, but it does allow you to get value off of your other creatures that recur permanence. You're hoping to just keep gaining life, get out of reach of your opponent's aggressive threats or burn spells. Next is a single copy of Palace Sentinels. It costs three and a white for a 2-4, and when it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. That means while you're the monarch, you draw an extra card on your end step. If someone who isn't the monarch deals damage to you, they become the monarch and start getting to draw the extra card instead. Becoming the monarch early can completely steamroll some decks in card advantage, especially in a deck like this where we're drawing into so much efficient interaction. I'm really happy to have a single palace sentinel so that sometimes when we really need it, we'll get lucky and become the monarch first thing. Our last creature that begins generating value as soon as it hits the battlefield is Muldrifter. It costs four and a blue for a 2-2 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, you draw two cards. You can also evoke it for two and a blue, which means when it enters the battlefield, you have to sacrifice it. You do still draw the two cards, so at worst, this card is just a divination. Muldrifter is definitely contending for my favorite ever popper card, and I'm super glad to see it here, especially highlighted as the card that we plan to finish the game with. Our last package is all about recursion. It's going to help us continue to trigger all of our useful enter the battlefield abilities, and this first part of that package also helps win the game by pecking in for evasive damage alongside Muldrifter. It's Core Skyfisher. It costs one and a white for a 2-3 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, you return a permanent you control to its owner's hand. Hopefully, that permanent is something that we can re-trigger and get some extra value out of. Our last non-land card, chosen over a fourth copy of Core Skyfisher, is Momentary Blink. It costs one and a white to exile target creature you control, then return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. You can flash this back out of your graveyard for three and a blue, furthering that synergy with Faithless Looting. I love seeing one of inclusions like this, especially replacing the fourth card in another package like Core Skyfisher. I think Momentary Blink is so smart. Sometimes you don't need the extra flyer, you just have to re-trigger something twice, and you can do it with this card perfectly. Even if you have to pitch it to a Faithless Looting, you can still get a one-time effect. It's just another added layer of excellent tuning and synergy. Alright, let's talk about this mana base. First, we have four copies of Ash Barons, which will help us go find basic lands, because you can pay one and discard it to go search your library for any color you're looking for. It's great because we're going to be leaving a mana to cast things like Lightning Bolt or Momentary Blink, so having an extra mana lying around on our opponent's end step isn't too much to ask for. Next, we have our Karoo lands. We're running six in total, which is a ton. I don't know that I've seen more than that in anything besides something like an Esper Familiar's List. Each of them enter the battlefield tapped. When they enter the battlefield, we have to return a land we control to our hand. When Azorius Chancery becomes untapped, you can add blue and white with it. You can add red and white with Boros Garrison, and you can add red and blue with Is It Boiler Works. Along with our Ash Barons, to tutor up the colors we need, we're also running six Popper Fetches in three Evolving Wilds and three Terramorphic Expanse. They're functionally the same. You can tap them, sacrifice them, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. Finally, we have our basics. Two islands, two mountains, and two plains. I think having two of each basic is really smart, because our fetch land should always have a target, but it'll also lead to some really interesting and difficult decisions when we're trying to search up a color to perform two spells in the same turn. And there you have it. Jeskai Control by making smart plays. Hopefully I can make some smart plays when I take this deck live into a league at twitch.tv slash any new province where they're every Monday night playing competitive popper decks. Before I go, I just want to remind you that you can like the video or subscribe to the channel down below. I'd seriously appreciate it. It's a great way to let me know you've enjoyed everything and it really encourages me to keep making great popper content. Thank you so much for watching this deck tech. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully I'll see you on Monday night.